Okay. Um, so how did everyone, how was everyone about that discussion that we just had? Everyone's fine with that? Good. -o. So should we call that discussion how to discover the truth about anything? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's, we don't have to, we can go home now. Yeah, yeah. You, you all know. Yeah. Uh, the process we described actually is actually described in the Paget messages in a message that the Apostle John gave to James Paget. And uh, he dis the Apostle John described uh, the way that I discovered truth in the first century. And in that message, it's a very sh quite a short message, it's only a page or a page and a half long. Um, and what I've described there with Mary is actually a bit of an extension of, of, uh, of, that, of that process that we described to Paget. <clears throat> All right, is there any more questions we'd like to ask? Fantastic. Um, just a quick, uh, I don't know if that's going to be quick or not, but um, I just want to know the scenario between people that are separated with children. I, got, I spoke about it briefly last time in Melbourne. I've been listening to Cornelius and mm -hmm. you know, stuff on the internet and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. it's, a bit, it's a bit weird for me to try to work out because say, there's me and my ex-partner, mm -hmm. Milana. Yep. Yep. And then Laura and her ex-partner have Isha. Yep. And now we've come together as a family yep. and We've got all this dynamic of you know anger with our parents and all this kind of mother father stuff happening. Yep. And I've got two girls, so all my mother stuff has ramped up massively today. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just trying to work out like how does like I know look she's nearly eight, so yep. I've created that much causal emotion in her that I know that I've done. Yep. Which I still have felt a little bit of it, but not the extent of it all yeah but like the dynamic it's just really strange for me to work out like when what's the law of attraction event at home when someone like just say we're sitting down and, you know we're doing something and Nisha comes in and she's whinging about something and I start to feel something so I go in the room and then Laura's like well that's not my emotion I'm like well it's all this confusion yeah like, as to whose emotion is causing what, what event is that is that is that your ex's emotion there or <laughs> is that your <laughs> Can I point out something first? I'm sure you're going to go into this at length, but firstly, there's a law of attraction and a common set of injuries that brought you and your ex-partner together. Yes. Same with Laura. Her and her ex-partner, they had compatible injuries that formed a relationship. Now, those relationships ended, but if you think about it logically, there's a high likelihood that some of the emotional injuries that each partner had each of you have, yeah. because you've now formed a relationship. Yeah. So the key I feel is when something happens in a family and a child's reflecting something, this, this, oh no, that's yours. Oh no, they're going to you, it's because, like, or is, it happen. is that yours? Yeah. <laughs> or let's blame the partner who's not even in, like, here. I, through all that. I started <laughs> saying, well, this is all mine. I was going, yeah. like, this is all mine, and I was going, everything that's happening here is my law of attraction. Yeah, but, that, but that, that's also I, not true, is it? Yeah. yeah, I was feeling, well, now I'm just, over blaming yourself yeah, yeah. for everything. Yeah. yeah. But the truth is for every single event that happens in all of our lives, it's a law of attraction for every single person involved in that. So that is the truth. So whenever something happens to go, oh, that's yours or oh, it's all mine, that's not the truth. The truth is both of our souls have created something that's happening in front of us right now. So that's, a, that's the starting point, if you like. But the question I would ask is why even intellectualise that process? Um, like anger first. Get so a lot of rage first. Fr you feel rage towards yeah. the event. Towards just the, the annoyance of the event. Yes. So, yes. So I get all this rage, and then all the fear of actually having the rage because I was never allowed to have that rage, and then I know that the rage has got something to do with my mum and something to do with my dad. So I definitely don't touch the rage. Yeah. 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 So I'm like, well. Oh, I can't, I'm trying to step into it, but it's just so... Well, let's try to help that process, right? So, so you know that rage exists inside of yourself about some of these events that are getting triggered. But, but what does rage cover? Yeah. Fear. And to be probably more specific, um, for most of us, it's more like terror than fear. 
If, if we've got rage, not mild irritation, the likelihood yeah. is that we're carrying terror. So if the top emotion was just irritation, <laughs> then that would be more like covering fear. <laughs> you follow? The level of the, the level of the fear as it intensifies, creates the level of the corresponding emotion of trying to get out of it. But there are two sides to, to anger and rage. The two sides are, firstly, that it always covers some kind of fear, but secondly, that the rage occurs because we don't want to feel that and instead we enter what's called an addiction. Or you could think of an addiction as a demand or an expectation. Right, so, so, if I have a lot of feelings with women where I want a woman to love me, but the women in my immediate vicinity don't seem to love me very much, then I will have a demand upon them to love me. But when that demand doesn't become fulfilled by them, I will then go, because of the addiction will demand it, I will go into the anger to get them back into control, basically. So, so can you see how there's this relationship between the terror or the fear that we feel, the addiction that we've put in place to avoid the terror that we feel, and then when the addiction isn't met, the rage that comes about as a result. Do you follow me? So in every case, Irritation, in this case, uh, like this might be a mild fear that, that again we have an addiction covering and then the irritation is present because of the fear not being uh, felt inside of ourselves. So every time there's a feeling inside of you of wanting to go to rage, the reality is that the emotion you need to be prepared to feel is not the rage, but rather the terror. So I've gone in and I've, you know, expressed rage dramatically many times. And it doesn't and help very it, much. Not to you guys, no. And I've done it lovingly on my own, yeah. which I learnt through listening to a lot of what you guys said. Yep. But, but it like, hasn't got you deeper. It's, it has, like, well, in one incident ever like, that I've had that I've actually just cried for days. I went away and I cried and cried and cried. And awesome. actually felt a bit of a change in me, but yep. the still... It's, it's like it's just scraped a little bit off the top yeah. and I'm still way too scared to feel this rage. So. Yeah. so the area to work on is the terror, the fears in other words. That's the area to work on. Now the problem that we have as guys mostly is we don't want to acknowledge that we're afraid. Like a, wo a woman saying she's afraid, that's allowable, right? Because the men go to the woman's rescue when she's afraid. You follow me? But the man being afraid, who comes to your rescue? No one comes to your well, rescue. The woman goes, you, you're not sexy anymore. Yeah, the woman, the woman treats you like you're no longer important and you're no longer valid. And then on top of that, um, you don't feel that good about yourself because you're afraid. And so, you know, usually what we want to do as males is shut down the fear process. So one of the biggest problems we have is shutting down the fear process by not acknowledging it as a male. Many women will acknowledge their fears but not allow themselves to feel them fully. Or they acknowledge their fears and want the man to actually make all of their fears go away. But when the man gets into the state where he's afraid, there's nobody around him to make it go away generally. And in fact, um, the woman often becomes even more afraid than he is of his own fear. Right, because she then becomes scared for her security. So, so the truth is for many men, the reason why rage is the preferable option or anger is the preferable option is because we, we don't want to acknowledge what we're terrified about. What if you actually know that there is a great fear or terror there mm -hmm. but you still don't go and feel it because... So the question then becomes why? What do I believe will happen when I experience terror? Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, I'm just afraid of my fear. And, and my question back is no. Ask yourself, what am I afraid of will happen when I submit to my fear? Because that gets you closer. This fear of fear thing sort of 
is very distancing from the fear emotion. But if I go, I'm afraid that when I just sit here and shake, people are going to attack me more. Right, now, I'm, now I've identified my block to the feeling of it. So one feeling that you have in particular when it comes to women is that you feel that if you're vulnerable with a woman, she will just use that against you at another point in the future. So she'll use that as a way of controlling you further. So you already feel quite controlled at times by women. Case in point, you have three of them and two children that are quite you know, controlling of the dad. And, and then if you're even more vulnerable, you feel that you're going to get even more controlled. So the only way to avoid that place where you get more controlled is to actually skip into the anger where they go, well, daddy's angry, let's stay away from him. And now you feel like at least some degree of freedom again. Some degree. Putting fear back into them. Yeah, but see, don't, don't, see, what you're trying to do now is you're going into the self-punishment where you're feeling bad about what you do rather than understanding what you do. So it's far better, like, I, while I agree what's happening is damaging to you, the girls, you must understand that actually, firstly, you need to look at why do I do this rather than, rather than, oh, I'm a terrible man, look at what I do to my children, you know, rather than going down that track. Because going down that track doesn't help you at all. All that does is judge the situation. It judges your own emotion and it doesn't release anything. It's far better to go, okay, I know this is damaging to my girls and I don't want to do it anymore, but let's look at why I do it. What, what is actually happening? What, what is happening inside of me? Why don't I want to go to that terror? So in this case, the terror of being unloved by the female, how does that feel? There's a lot of grief in that, right? Um, and for most men actually on the planet, there's a lot of grief in that. So many women don't believe this, but actually most men on the planet have deep amounts of grief about the lack of femininity on the planet. The reality is that as yet, there is yet to be a divine expression of femininity on the planet in the entire of human history. There was a divine expression of masculinity on the planet when I was here 2,000 years ago. But since then, there's not been any divine expression of femininity, or even prior to then, any divine expression of femininity on the planet, to a complete degree, to the, to the point where a woman is at one with God while on earth. Now, that will happen in the future, right? But many men have huge amounts of grief about that. The fact that there has never been this expression of, if you like, the feminine side of God on the earth. Now, there are many uh, forms of religious movements and New Age movements today who claim to have the goddess, you know, type of thing going on. It is full of rage. And in fact, uh, there are many of those spirits who are guiding that movement are currently attacking me because of what I'm saying about masculinity and femininity. And, uh, and those women who are leading these feminist movements, new age movements, uh, the, which are all spirits, by the way, are in such rage with men, they actually want men to be completely under the control of women. Huh? It, ironically, they attack me as well, the more I try and step towards the state. that. Mm. And they will attack any yeah. woman who decides to connect with her mate in a true and positive, loving sense. Right? So the truth is that any woman who attempts to connect to their, ma their mate, in a, their male mate, in a loving manner will automatically come under the attack of these women. Right? So it's one of the unfortunate things that are happening on the planet today. Now, many men have huge amounts of grief about this, about the lack of soft femininity. Un in other words, femininity without judgment of the male. So if you go along to an average, uh, if you're like a fly on the wall with an average discussion with a group of six women in a restaurant, and quite often you can, you, you can be that because you just go along a restaurant and quite often you hear, they'll all be talking about their men and most of the time it's rare to find any love in the discussion about the male, right? And that creates huge amounts of grief in the men that the men are unwilling to actually feel. 
because they're terrified to go to that level of grief, you know, the level of grief that they have. And so what they do, they're terrified of this grief, and so the only other choice that they see is to go into the addiction of rage to get the women back into, well, hang on a sec, you've got to have some respect for me here, and, you know, into those kind of emotions. Now, as a male having these emotions, what we need to do is we need to choose to not go there and actually to feel this terror which will be a bodily experience that we feel, and then allow ourselves to go to the grief. And the only reason why we don't do that is because we're afraid of what will happen if we do that. So what you need to do is look at the belief systems you have about what will happen if you actually cry in front of the woman, if you actually feel sad and actually cry. And do you know what <coughs> demonstrates that this is your block, Fab? Is that when you went away from all the women in your life, you cried for days and days, didn't you? So you know that there's a fear around, if I do this in front of a woman... Yeah, I won't cry much in front of Laura. Like, no. I'll start and then I'll... Go yep. away, yeah. Quickly go. Yeah. 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 Most, we, most men I know have a lot of difficulty crying in front of the woman and, or, or being, having a woman present while they're crying. There's huge amounts of reasons why that's the case. Most of it coming from the women, to be frank, ladies. Um, but there is huge amounts of emotion in the women directed at the male. Many women automatically go into fear when their man starts crying. And the reason why is because the man in that state is no longer going to protect them, no longer going to bop somebody else in the nose for them when, when they need it, no longer going to provide security for them. And now the woman is left exposed in her own fear. Huh? And also I get afraid when AJ cries because I have a huge injury from my dad that when he was sad I had to make him happy or he would get angry. So I just feel like he starts crying, I'm afraid he's going to be angry. You know, so that's a huge block that I put out there towards his tears. Yeah. Yeah. So th there is a lot of resistance around us as males to our crying, not only our own resistance. A lot of women around us also have huge resistance to our crying. The key, if you're in a partnership, is for the women to ask themselves, well, what resistance do I have to the male crying? Sometimes you'll find the resistance is, I feel that the man shouldn't cry because he's got nothing to cry about. He's the one that's got everything fine. You know, sometimes there's that kind of an emotion where the, you know, the man has a lot easier life than I do, so, or, you know, why is he crying? There's also often this uh, feeling inside the woman that if a man cries, he's automatically weak and he's therefore unattractive. And most men want to be attractive to their partners. And so they automatically no longer want to cry in front of their partners because they feel automatically that their partners feel that they're no longer attractive. There's also a feeling in the men that they're no longer male if they cry. And, uh, and that often not only came from their fathers but also from their mothers. Um, so so there, are, there are often deep beliefs inside of us as men that when we cry we are now weak, no longer attractive, no longer sexually attractive, no longer uh, wanted, you know, and, and then a lot of times, not only that, we feel the anger and the fear from our partner. The anger in the, the partner goes, well, what have you got to cry about? There's nothing wrong in your life. And the fear of, like, f having the partner's disapproval and no longer feeling like the partner is attracted to us. And so there's quite a lot of resistance and the key so is some shame in there too. Yeah, some shame. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a man. I'm not a I'm man like anymore. Weak. How can you find me attractive if I'm doing this? Yeah. Yep. The key is to allow yourselves to start dis discovering those emotions as men, in terms of it, discover the emotion that's present in this. You know, what do you feel will happen if you are open and vulnerable with with the woman? Yeah, because I, can I say on the reverse, like obviously I have a lot of, I've had a lot of emotions, maybe not obviously, but I have had a lot of trouble feeling emotions around other people as well, and even around AJ at times, like I couldn't cry in front of him, and, mm. and so he's someone who's not even projecting anything at me, but I'm carrying these beliefs from my dad and my mum, so even if Laura cleared all of her projections, you've still got this feeling from your mum about what's going to happen when I cry, you know, how she treated men who were what she perceived to be too emotional or 
Yeah. yeah. And your dad also gave you. My dad was never weak. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Strong. Always tough. Yeah. Yeah. Toughs it out. That's what yeah. a man is. That's and and both our mothers and our fathers taught us to tough. To t a male toughs it out. A male stands up. A male, you know, he looks after the woman. You know, he doesn't, he's not the one who needs looking after. <laughs> you know, he looks after the woman and so forth. And as a result of that, we have a lot of terror, emotional terrors about feeling our grief. And most of our emotional terrors as men actually relate to what the woman will feel about us if we go into these emotions. So, you know, quite often there's a lot of, uh, you know, feelings of resistance that we feel towards going into the emotion. If I cry, like when we first met, if I cried, Mary automatically viewed me as weak. Uh, I would have said com something completely different. No, it's really good for men to cry. Like, I think that's great. Well, like, I was very, you know, new age. But the feeling was panic. Like, was, uh, uh, this is out of control. I'm afraid now. And this... This man can't protect me. All of those things. Yeah. And before I met my soulmate, like I, I years ago was with another woman, and when I cried, she would scream at me, like literally scream at me for crying. Yeah. So she went into rage instead of feeling her terror. <laughs> so she would be so freaked out about my crying that she would actually be angry with me, which would of course turn off my. I also crying. notice that if I don't want to feel the rage. I just bite my nails, like constantly yeah, yeah. bite my That's nails, it. Like yeah. just to, and get out of my head, just yeah. like daydreaming somewhere. Yeah, there is further forms of suppression which many men revert to, and above there is the intellectualization of everything. Right, we have a tendency to go into that, or just disengagement, like <laughs> detachment from. And we disengage. So you see a lot of men going to work too much as a result. So if your man is working too much. Right? then as ladies have a look at the projections going at them because usually they're like, like do you think, I said this, I know this is, sounds pretty bad but <laughs> it's okay, it's, it's going to be in video for you to laugh at later. Um, the, um, I said this to a group of people a few weeks ago, do you think that a man would be out working if his lady was home waiting for him to come home and jump into bed with him? No, definitely not. Like, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> right. So, so the fact is that most men don't feel that from their from their wives or their partners, um, and in fact, they feel something completely different. And as a result of that, they don't feel good when they're home. And a lot of times, as a result of not feeling good when they're home, they go out and work more because that makes them feel better. It actually helps them detune. It makes them feel like they're, you know, contributing to the family. It makes them feel like they're powerful men. In fact, many men have business jobs and whatever that are powerful, and yet they go home to their relationship at home and they no longer have any power. Yeah, and uh, and so a lot of men avoid avoid their rage about that and avoid their terror about the grief that they feel about that by going into this really intellectual space where they're going to achieve, they're going to work hard, they're going to avoid, and so forth as a result. And the key is to see it as an issue from the Mao's perspective. The issue is we're afraid of addressing all of these issues uh, for a lot of different reasons. From the female's issue, there's a, the issue of allowance of the male's true feelings. Um, there's a lot of denial of a male's true feelings. Well, you look at it, how many women get together and they say, oh, my man doesn't feel at all. And to be frank, that is so condescending to actually say, because most men do have very, very deep feelings about a lot of things. We just don't express them as, more, as openly as women do. And one reason why we don't express them openly is because the other men <laughs> who we're talking to don't want to express them openly either. And the women who we're with are scared of us ever expressing those emotions. Can you see? So what's, what's left after that? The person you want to go to to talk to emotions, you can't, but you can't go to your mates because they all have the same emotion you do and they don't want to feel it either, right? So where do you go after that? Well, for, for, if a man's not willing to go to a therapist or somebody to talk to, which most men aren't, let's face it, he is left to stew in his own emotion. 
And this is why the emotion in many men just builds and builds and builds and builds to breaking point. Um, because there's no outlet, there's no way of letting it go. There's no way of releasing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so focus on why I'm afraid, but your fears won't be physical probably. For most men our fears are not physical. For most men our fears are more related to emotions, uh, related to our partner in particular, or how our partner sees ourselves, how our partner sees us. Yeah. And the key is to feel about those emotions and allow ourselves to express that truthfully. So, so, and it might not be your current partner, like Laura, it might be previous partners or your mother that has had these emotions and now, but, but the law of attraction usually means that if mum's had it and a previous partner had, that your current partnership will probably have similar emotions as well towards men. So, for, for example, in Laura, you have been always attracted to a powerful man who doesn't have much emotional expression, right? He talks about it, but doesn't always feel it. And that gives you a sense of feeling secure and safe for you to experience your own emotion. That's what it gives you. So I would look at that emotionally, how much of, how much of that is a projection upon the partner to actually um, prevent you know, you want the partner to be shut down so that, so that you're not feeling scared when he doesn't, when he goes into his tears, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, it's interesting because I can say intellectually that, that I would be encouraging of his tears, but that cannot be true because when I cry and the girls come in or Fab comes in, I wipe my tears. Yep. And then when I've allowed myself to still cry um, when the girls and Fab are present, it's like the emotion has just snapped out of me. Like I can't bring the, the, the depth of the grief back and then soon as the door gets shut, bang, I can fall down on my knees into the grief again, but I can't allow it to happen. So if I'm that with me, then I've, I'd definitely... Definitely got that projection going at the male and in fact more so because you then see him as your security. He's, he's the safe person who's around you while you can have your cry. Do you know what I mean? And so that projection is going to be at him. Don't you connect to your emotion, particularly when I'm connecting with mine. Yeah. yeah. And then we also, both of us, go through a lot of different emotions, including real anger, because our, our parents are always telling the girls not to cry, and they're always giving them chocolates and giving them sweets and giving them anything to prevent the tears. Yeah, uh, and the yeah. distraction, and, and then we look at each other like, where do we take this? Like, well, where you take it is that both of you have a terror about grief. And your parents are demonstrating it. They, they parented you after all, so they're showing what they're showing to your girls what they did to you, you know. And the minute we say, no, let them cry, we've both been absolutely attacked and massively spirit attachment with the attack yeah. that we are, you know, what... Yeah. The, the and there's the your terror yeah. to your grief. Your terror to your grief is that if I allow myself to feel my grief, I'm going to get the rage of my parents. Yeah, the rage of our mothers particularly. Into, yeah, yeah, mothers in particular females. for both of you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the only other thing for yourself uh, to have a look at is this, um, uh, is this feeling that you have to do what the woman says, right? You've got this feeling inside of you that if, if the woman's unhappy, the whole family's unhappy, you have to do what the woman says. In fact, that's a saying, isn't it, that goes on quite frequently. And it's quite often very true, because, because if the woman's unhappy, she often makes sure everyone else is unhappy at the same time. So, so the key for you, again, there is this is all about the fear of your mother, the fear of your mother's rage, the fear of her control. I just started noticing that, because my mum will not... If she's down, everyone else has to go has to right be down. down with her. Yep. Yeah. And that, if you're not, then she's just full self attack on her yeah because she also she, she'll either go into self attack of herself so, so that you have to commiserate with her at some or point attack my dad. or attack somebody else yeah uh, for being unsupportive yeah and the truth is that uh, that mothers like that create children who are so afraid to feel their grief that every time their grief begins to come up they just the, ch the child will go into terror 
Uh, they know that if, if they have an emotion, and there's a, there's a really good book, the, the Narcissistic Mum book, yep. that, you, that helped you enough. a lot. There's yeah. a, uh, what's, who's that by? Uh, Carol McBride. Yeah. Carol McBride, uh, Will I Ever Be Good Enough? It's for daughters of narcissistic mothers, but I feel it's probably okay for children of narcissistic mothers. So uh, let's define a narcissistic mother. A mother who is not able to understand that her cho their children have their own emotion. And the mother who wants the children to feel only their mother's emotion. And, uh, and to be frank, it's a very, very common <laughs> emotional injury in many mothers because many mothers have children just so that they share in mum's emotion. The, the, many mums even begin the process of having children for that only, only that reason. So my suggestion is have a read of that book. There's also a series of books by Alice Miller. Yeah, you've got those. Uh, have a good read of those books too, because that'll help you uh, detune from this connection that you both have with the mother and start to connect with your own emotions and allow your own emotions. You have a deep fear and that's why when you're with your mothers, either one, the mothers will automatically prevent the grief of your own children because you're trying to prevent your own grief when you're with your own mothers as well. Because you're afraid. <coughs> You're afraid. The other day I was um, playing Guitar Hero and it was Fab's birthday and we were both like, he was on the drums and I was on the guitar, we were having an absolute ball. And then I didn't, wasn't making coffee for the guests and my mother literally stood right by my side, crossed her hands, didn't say a word but projected such like attack. I started sweating like it was go and be a host and attend to, the, attend to making coffee instead of having fun with my partner on his birthday. But I started sweating and it went on for that long. And I started literally like shaking and I just felt the, the worst attack I've ever felt because I've been... And what did you say, Laura? I didn't actually say anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can you see? See, if you were really connected with yourself and not afraid of your mother, you would have said, Mum, what you're doing now is actually quite nasty. You're sitting there projecting at me, and she'll deny it, of course. You're sitting there, go, you can just say, go away. Go away, Mum. You're, you're, you're causing me lots of discomfort, and I, and I want to do what I'm doing. But is, you... Is everyone nervously laughing? They're all like, oh, I couldn't say that to Mum. <laughs> how many of you would feel bad about saying that to your mother? Then you tell her, then now you you're being see? unloving, you, are really you actually now can leave my house. <laughs> and if I was in her house, I would just get up and leave and say, you're just far too unloving for me to be around. That's what I would do. Um, I would not compromise on it at all. I know that but in that moment I was praying and feeling my emotions and, and holding my desire, but I know that nothing changed on a soul level because I didn't actually speak up and communicate. So my, my throat... You didn't embrace still... the situation. No. Yep. And yeah. remember, uh, well, I was talking to Elvira earlier about like step into yeah, the truth I... of the situation. You know, just that's the step that it's really hard to take, and you need you know warm up sometimes to go. Oh, I didn't do it. Okay, yeah. Well, you you will probably shake. You'll oh, be. I will. The, the fact is, angry. you were yeah. just shaking when she was doing this to oh, you. Oh, I was playing yeah. the drums and I couldn't even do that with my leg because I was shaking that much. Yeah. 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 And, and so the key is to embrace that situation, challenge this thing that is in your mothers. And your mothers have actually are in quite dark condition. They both believe they have, should have total control of your life whenever they're around you. And as a result of that, unless that you challenge them when they're on earth here, they're going to pass into the spirit world in a pretty bad place. And, and also, not only that, you've, the way... It, don't even just do it for them, but also do it for yourselves in the sense that unless you begin to speak up against oppressive behaviour, you will continue to respond in fear towards oppressive behaviour. Do, do you follow me? It's not just about feeling the emotions. That can be a bit of a cop-out sometimes. Yes, yeah, certainly. A lot of people are not acting. You need to act in the most loving way. Now, the most loving way, if you've got a person barraging you with their rage or even their demand, the most loving thing to go to is say, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to respond to your demand. Huh? You might be going, I'm sorry. And then they can say, oh, I didn't have a demand. I'm sorry, but you did, and you just need to go away now. 
<laughs> if it was my house, I'd feel completely in my right to do that. If it was their house, I wouldn't do that. I'd say, I'm sorry, but I need to go away now. And I'd be out the door. Right? Just, re just recently up at, we, you know how we've got all this God's way of love starting up and, and it's quite interesting at times. Anyway, we had a group of people over for, uh, they were helping us, we're, we're turning our house into an office and, uh, and there were a heap of people helping us pack up all of our, well I'd call it rubbish probably, um, and putting it into, into a, a shipping container. And one lady came up to me with this bag of seeds and she says to me, she hands them to me and says, I've got all these seeds that are really wonderful. And she starts explaining the seeds to me and what the wonderful things about the seeds are. And I'm going, no worries. And she's going, yeah, and it's really wonderful. What can I do with them? And the man next to me had actually already talked to her. He was the leader of the environment team standing next to me. And he'd said, actually, didn't we talk about this last week? <laughs> she said, yes. And I said, well, why do you now want to have the bag of seeds presented to me when you could have just gone up to the leader of the environment team, his name's Dennis, you could have just gone up to Dennis and given him the seeds, which you know he wants. Why did you have to make such a song and dance about it? All right. And then she started going, oh, well, it's because, oh, and she started feeling, and she goes, oh, I can feel I just want your approval and everything. I said, yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she left <laughs> straight away um, crying, but um, she felt very rejected. Now, was I rejecting her? No, I was actually denying her the addiction of getting my approval. That's what I was doing. That's not a rejection. That in fact, remember we said when you're at one with God, that's what you do 100% of the time. So, yeah. so I wasn't rejecting her. I was just in that place denying her addiction. She went away feeling rejected. So is that the right feeling for her to feel if she wants to get closer to God? Well, was it the truth of what was happening? It's not the truth of what was happening. I was not rejecting her. What is the truth? She doesn't want to feel the demand for the addiction being met. But instead of feeling that, she goes away feeling rejected. Interesting. Can you ever become at one with God by feeling an emotion that's not really there? I don't think so. With the rubber. I just would like to raise something about this with each of you. This is a basic thing about emotions that we need to probably understand. You didn't get that at all, no. We need to use the mic, Deidre. Yes, 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 you do need to use the mic. Oh, I just hate the sound of my own voice. Ah, <laughs> we don't. We love the sound of your voice. I... But, because that's happened to me, mm -hmm. but I feel rejected mm. by men anyway. So mm. it might not be the emotion at the time, but it's still an emotion within me. Let me explain. Okay. Yeah, it's always good having an explanation, isn't it? Here's the self that God sees. Um, you can draw it as a circle if you want, <laughs> but I'm going to draw it as a square because I'm going to write in. We'll call it the real self that's the self whoops that's the self that god created right the pristine clean self the true personality that you are yeah which is nothing like you currently are by the way right? <laughs> thank god for that she says all right this is the real self it's the pristine self god created no injuries. This one is the injured self. Self. This is the self that your parents created. Do you understand? Through all of the, and your environment basically, but your parents are the primary creators of this environment. So this is God's creation. This is your parents' creation. Do you understand? So far. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> this creation is the one most of you are having trouble it's the facade self who created that <laughs> which you created now the key here is to get the significance of the relationship between these three parts of yourself this self you created so that you could avoid this self and this self your parents and your environment created so they could avoid this self you get it now if you look at this you will see actually it's very interesting because the only part that I need to actually clear away that are causal emotions are related to this self, aren't they? They're not actually this self. There won't be many causal emotions related to this self because the, this is a self I created for myself. So in other words, I prefer to be here than I, am, than I do to be here. I prefer to see the facade self. Now, what do I prefer to see from the facade self? Is that where I, you said that I use fear as an excuse? Ah, uh, yes. Something? Ex I'm too afraid. I can't do it. I'm too afraid. Fear excuses. So that's different from going, I'm really afraid. And yeah. That's the facade self. Yep. What else? Nobody loves me. I'm just so rejected. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll just go and... No Bobby loves me. That's probably true too. No Bobby. <laughs> they all reject me. There's a heap of stories. Now these stories are not consistent for each person. They're very, very different for each person. So don't say just and because... Just because this emotion is here doesn't mean it does exists. Yeah, doesn't that's exist. Or doesn't exist there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we use these emotions here, uh, and there's a long list of them that we could make. We use these emotions here in order to avoid the other emotions. Now one emotion that is used a lot is, oh, I feel rejected. Right? Now, the truth is, with my interaction with that lady, I... So, let's, let's see what the facade... Sorry, I have, I'm the lady. So, so Mary's the lady. Control. Let's call her Jane, right? <laughs> is that all right, Jane, if we call her Jane? It wasn't Jane, by the way, so <laughs> just, just to make that clear. <laughs> um, so, here's the seeds. Here's the seeds, and I'm asking what, what's going on with with you like why do you have to offer me the seeds and i go i just i really wanted to share this gift with you you know and i'm going no it's, it's not that and then you, what do you tell me go no 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 here. no i first asked her i asked her what what is it really and then she started saying oh it's because i want your approval bingo that she is right at that particular moment she does want my approval is that not a demand can you see that that is a demand? She is demanding my approval and the way she's going to try to earn it is by giving me something that she feels will earn it in that moment. You get me? Is that not a demand? Of course it is. Is that love? No, it's not. It's a bartering system for my approval. That's all it is. Right? So she's handing it to me right? and I'm not taking it from her. <laughs> I'm going, okay. What is going on? She says, oh, I'm seeking your approval. Spot on. Right at that moment, spot on. She was in the right emotion. She so was seeking my approval. She started out facade self. I just want to share this beautiful gift with you. Ades is not. I'm sorry, that's not true. So, okay, I want your approval. I want your approval. Yes. Yes, spot on. Spot on. Causal emotion in that somewhere. And then I say, well, now go away and feel that. Oh, okay. And what does she go away feeling? Rejected. Rejected. She went away feeling rejected. Can you see? She's now not feeling the causal emotion, which was she wanted my approval, which was a demand. She was demanding on me something that was highly unloving, something 
that I didn't have to give and neither should, if I loved her, give her because she was demanding it. And in that moment, she now went away in a completely facade emotion. So, feeling rejected. Some people cry for three hours. I was rejected. It felt really bad. AJ rejected me again. No, I did not reject you. I prevented you from having your addiction met. That's not a rejection. That is actually an action of, of love to prevent someone from having their addiction met. So what would be the way I would deal with it causally? So, so if she had just followed my advice when I turned, her and said, turned around and said, go away and feel that emotion, the emotion I was referring to was the emotion of, I want AJ's approval and I'm not getting it. Do you, do you follow me? That's the emotion she needed to feel. That's where I feel like everyone needs to start with addiction. A lot of people go, oh, I've got an addiction to man's approval. It's got to be dad stuff, should be grief. Okay, go and cry about feeling rejected by dad. And the truth is they're doing an intellectual skip to the emotion that they think they should be having and go, I'm crying about this. The truth is they're not. They're crying, I want my addiction met and I'm not getting it met. And I, it's really a surface layer emotion. And it's also a demand. It's also very unloving. In that moment, by, by crying and saying, I'm not getting my addiction met, you're actually being even more unloving that you, than you were prior. Right? And it's even worse if I'm crying about not getting my addiction met and saying, now I'm crying about Dad rejecting me. And you can cry like that for 10 years and you're never going to get rid of the causal emotion that created it. You're still going to come with a bunch of seeds. Yeah. <laughs> the next time you get the opportunity. Yeah. What, to deal with it authentically, I would go away and go, oh no, I really want that man's... I, and I've done I wanted recently. that approval. I want that emotion from him. Like, I really feel like I need it. I really want it. And it, it's hurting that I'm not getting it. And, and I, I feel angry that I haven't got it. And I feel frustrated with him. Why couldn't he just give it to me? He could have given it to me, you know. <laughs> it's just a little bit of effort. He could have just said, thank you very much. You're a wonderful woman. And it, just one line like that, and I would have got my addiction met. And then I go, whoa, hey, I've got a lot of demand here. Like when I really go into that emotion, I can go, yeah, I'm really wanting a lot from this man. Wow. And if I'm sincere, I'll go, that's a big demand I've got going on. Wow, that must be covering a lot of pain in me. And I must be pretty afraid to feel that pain because otherwise I wouldn't be demanding it from every man. And so immediately my process becomes more causal. Yeah. If I want to tell myself a pretty story, I go up, I feel rejected, I go, well, that's because I wanted his approval, I don't have dad's right, cry, cry, cry. It's all about dad's rejection, but the truth is I'm not really feeling it. And if you're honest with yourself, what you're feeling is, I want him to give me what I want, which is very different from crying, I feel like I'm nothing to dad. It's a very different place. Mm. One's way up here and one's way down here mm. in terms of you. Hard. Let me give you another example. On the same day this happened, we had about 40 people there, so during the day, you know, of course, there's a lot of addictive <laughs> things happening, but, uh, and I could list 25 of them probably off the top of my hat that I remember, but there's this other one that happened which was quite interesting too, similar kind of event. This lady went up to this uh, other fellow um, and said to him, and started talking to him uh, about her emotions and, and her process, and he says to her, Wow, I think you're doing pretty good, actually. From what you're saying? From what so you're like saying, it seems like you're doing pretty good. She says, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. AJ never says that to me. <laughs> and then he realised in that moment that he'd been just suckered into it an addiction. <laughs> and then you know what she said? It's interesting that you said it to me. Don't you think that means that you might have an addiction to please? Yeah, she actually so she went one step further. Give me, give me approval, give me approval. He gave it and she went, gee, you've really got an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> How about that one? I thought that was pretty good. But again, the person saying, first and feeling, because I have not said to them, you're doing pretty good, the truth is I don't feel she's doing pretty good. So I can't say she's doing pretty good when I don't feel she's doing pretty good. Does that make sense? Um, and so the truth is, I've just treated her in the manner that I feel truthful with. So, 
But she, she then goes away feeling like, I want AJ to say to me, I'm doing really good, I'm doing really good, I want that from him so much. So her injured self, she needs to feel how much she wants that. Not go and get it from somebody else. She needs to feel how much she wants that. Does that make sense? And if we, like, we know now, right, addictions cover fear, which covers grief. The key, though, to dealing with addiction is first recognising the extent of the addiction. Hmm. You can't just skip to the grief. It's not going to work. You have to want to open your eyes and see how much this permeates your entire life and then go, am I willing to give this up? <laughs> yeah, it's quite an intellectual do. process initially, but the yeah. more you engage it, the more emotional more natural it, becomes. it becomes. Yeah. You go, whoa, I get that from Laura, I get that from Mary had a I day, the corner store. you had a day about a month ago or so, was it two months ago, so she comes walking up from the tent, because uh, we've been sleeping apart for a bit, and she comes walking up the tent, she goes, I'm just a crack at it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, I've got addiction after addiction after addiction. I want you to meet this, and I want you to meet that, and I want you to meet, yeah, well, I could feel this is really bad, AJ, and I go, yeah. No, you don't understand. It's really bad. <laughs> I said, no, everything I do, everything, there's an addiction. It's, and, and I'm stopping myself from going into the addictive place, but holy, it feels really, really bad. And I sometimes just want you to give me that emotion. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's when you become honest with yourself about your addiction. You start seeing how much of it is in play. You know, it's very important to see that. So can you see the difference between this facade self, the self that you created, this the injured self, the self that the parents damaged, and then this real self, the one that's got no injury that God created, what we're aiming for is this one, right? But to get to that one, we've got to feel this one. But we, in order to avoid feeling this one, created this one. And so what we find happening for many people is they keep creating emotions for them to experience without actually ever getting to a causal emotion. So in other words, by me saying, I feel rejected in a situation where you're not being rejected, you have just created an imaginary emotion for you to feel in order to prevent you from feeling the real one. What's the point of that? Can you see? There's no point in that. Like, it doesn't yeah. accomplish anything. But do you know why <coughs> we do it? Why do you think we create this self? The facade self. The facade self. <laughs> So less pain. We reckon it's less pain. That's what we think. What do we believe about this self? How's everyone else going to die? You want to? How's everyone else going to feel about this uh, this this self? This self? Yeah, they're going to feel sorry for me. They're going to commiserate with me. I'm and the I, victim. The truth is, I feel this self is going to be loved more than this self. Gets more love. That's my false belief. If I have an emotion where I'm a victim all the time, then I haven't done anything bad to anyone, and so people love me more. Can you also see, though, that this one is our preferred image of ourself? Yes. That's in other words, in this one, we sometimes have some very dark and evil emotions, actually. Mm -hmm. We actually have an emotions of demands, right the way down sometimes to murderous, to murderous feelings. Vengeful right? feelings. Vengeance. Uh, e and C, A and C. And, yeah, ENC. and also just emotions that our parents judge as bad. Uh -huh. So even when they come out into the light of the day, everyone else might th not think they're that bad. But if our parents told us you should be ashamed of that emotion, we'll create something else. So, so, so a lot of times we want to see this side of ourselves. So, so when somebody says to me, so, so the ladies that I mentioned in this, in this example, the first lady, she wanted to feel rejected because she didn't want to feel that she'd just been unloving and demanding with me. In other words, she didn't want to feel her own unlovingness. So instead, she blamed me for mine, which I never had. I didn't have a feeling where I was rejecting her. I told her to go away and feel the feeling of wanting my approval, which was the actual feeling she needed to feel. So can you see in that moment, she preferred to feel rejected rather than feeling that she herself had been unloving. She preferred there than there. <coughs> but if you prefer here, you will never grow and every emotion you experience is totally pointless. 
Do you understand? Process for hours. You can process for hours these emotions and nothing will change, ever. And ever. that should be the proof of your processing. Am I changing? Do I feel more loving to other people? Do I feel more connected to God? If the answers to those questions are not yes, okay. I need to look at my piles. Am I really emotionally processing? Yep. Like the truth is this this barrier here, this area here, is the area that we need to emotionally process. This area here is emotions of our own creation which are pointless processing. And can I say that the avoidance of two basic emotions create that self? Shame and fear. If I feel ashamed of what's inside of me or afraid of what's inside of me, I I'll will create the facade self. So the lady so, in question I mentioned, she was ashamed of the fact that she had just tried to control me and she had just tried to barter her way into my affection. Right? And it didn't work. And she was ashamed of that. And instead of feeling that, she would prefer to, she preferred to feel rejected by me instead. And yeah. yet if she was willing to just acknowledge the truth, see the extent of the addiction and feel some shame, boom, she would have been straight into her causal emotion. Does that make sense? Uh, just wait for the mic if you can. Yep. Um, yeah, it sounds a lot like me, but... <laughs> so I'm still not quite getting the chunk because I think it's me, but... Um, so if that lady had been, which I have, rejected by my mother and father and abandoned and stuff, yeah. Is that still not a causal? Remember I said at the beginning of this that the emotion of rejection may still be a causal emotion. In other words, that oh, you have yes. been rejected yes. by your mother or your father. However, case. you haven't been re ever rejected by me. No. So if you're crying about how I've treated you in being rejected, I've never rejected you. Even though in my injury I could see that you rejected me. No, but no. can you see, you yeah, need to be not. crying, if for it to be a causal emotion, you need to be crying about your father or mother's rejection yes. of you. Yes. Not no, mine, because yeah. oh, okay, yeah. I never rejected okay. you. Yeah. Can I demonstrate? <laughs> yeah. If we say, no board, if we say there's addiction and under addiction there's fear. And under the fear, or yeah, sometimes there's anger in there as well, but there's the grief. Yeah, the anger is usually in this yeah. direction. So. so if you think about it, when AJ said to the lady, I can't give you that approval, and she walked off crying about feeling rejected by, by AJ. By me. Yep. The truth yep. was she was crying about her addiction not being met. That's all. However, she could have taken another route and gone, whoa, I feel ashamed. I've just demanded something. Yeah. And that shows me the level of my addiction. Whoa, yeah. I must have a lot of fear. Oh, actually, I can feel that fear. I'm afraid that if I'm just myself around men and I don't I won't get anybody's them, approval. I, they're never going to love me. Yeah. And do you know what? That's taken me to a horrible place in my childhood. I feel like my dad rejected me. And there we go. I'm in the grief of rejection, but it's far more authentic. Yeah. So every I'm demand, every demand is unloving and an, is an addiction. Even yes. Subtle. Yep. Yes. And I have to want to see the truth of that, but have compassion for myself in that place. If I don't have compassion and I judge it, uh, even mm -hmm. like so in her case she didn't want to see the addiction so she's she's crying about an AJ yeah AJ yeah. if she had wanted to see the addiction mm -hmm. and go oh okay I must be in heavy addiction and then judged it she shuts down the process again but, but the irony is her, her father never rejected her right <laughs> as well it so she could be crying yeah. about rejection from her father but her father never rejected her the issue she has is her father never gave her approval and that's what the law of attraction event's about, the fact that she's not getting mine by bartering it. So, so she'd be more honest to feel the fact that daddy never gave me approval than she would be to feel the feeling of rejection. And that would be a causal? Of course, yeah. 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 So but she would step, she would recognise the truth of the situation. She would feel her fear and then she would be in her grief. Yeah. But most of us want to feel these emotions because these emotions have a better outcome for ourself. That's what we think. The reason why we think that is because we think, oh, I can maintain my facade of myself while I hold on to these emotions. So while this lady is feeling rejected, she's holding on to the facade of herself. And the facade of herself is actually, she's a very demanding, unloving woman when it comes to men. She demands men's approval constantly. That's her true self, you mean? That's her true self. Well, sorry, no, that's her injured, injured self. self. She demands 
uh, feelings of approval from men and she's willing to barter not only like some seeds but in the past she has bartered her whole body for it right she's actually bartered herself sexually for man's approval no other reason so so the reality is if she went off and felt that emotion she would have been far closer to what's really going on that there is this demand coming out her desire to barter and she would start looking at all and of that. hey, like there must be a lot of pain for one of us to barter sexually our whole body in order to get this emotion. So if she has compassion for herself, she'll go, this is a big addiction, but whoa, there must be something underneath it. Must be a big emotion underneath yeah. that. Yeah. But while she's feeling rejected by me, she is not getting anywhere near the demand and therefore never getting to what's under the demand and therefore never going to feel the causal emotion about it. So she can cry in her rejection for hours and, go and say to everybody, yeah, last week AJ you know, rejected me as well. But I had a good cry. But I had a good cry about it. And at the end, the whole thing's pointless. And it's also untrue, because I never did actually reject her. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's why truth is so essential to this path. It's about God, <laughs> desire, truth. And oh, emotions are like the add-on. They're the natural result of those three things. But if you don't have truth in your emotional processing, circular, you're only <laughs> going to stay in your comfort zone, aren't you? Yeah. Can I point out one more thing about this state? One thing I had to realise myself was that every little bit of grief I had was a demonstration of how unloving I was. Can I say that again? Every little bit of grief that I had was a demonstration of how unloving I was. Now, many of you are a bit confused about that statement, so I'll have to elucidate. <laughs> right? What I realised was that love would never be sad. You see, when you're in complete love, you are never sad. All of our celestial spirit friends who are at one with God are never sad, ever, right? They never cry about anything except out of joy, you know? So yes, your tear ducts are still used in the celestial heavens, but it's joyous tears in every occasion, right? Because you're so involved with something emotionally in your joy. But never out of sadness, never out of feeling grief, because all of the good grief is gone. So. If I have sadness in me and I'm crying about something, it's because in the, at the deepest level, I have something yet to learn about love. Does that make sense? I have something yet to learn about love. So, so Mary can totally reject me. And if I cry about it, I have an unloving thing going on inside of myself. Do you follow that? Because if I was in a state of complete love, I wouldn't cry about it, would I? I'd go, okay, Mary's allowed to reject me. She's got a bit of an issue with rejection, hasn't she? And whatever else she might have. But I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't be feeling sad about it myself. So what I had to come to terms with is that in this space of my injured self, I had to come to terms with the fact that actually every bit of crying, and it's okay to cry, so please don't think that it's not okay to cry in this discussion. It's important, it's to, important cry. to cry. I need to cry out the unlovingness. It's the only way it's going to release from me, in fact. But, but I needed to understand that every time I had a sadness in me and I wanted to cry, I was actually, it was, it was a lesson in love that I was yet to learn. And once I'd learnt that lesson in love, in terms of once I've fully embraced it in my soul, I would no longer cry about that same thing. Do you follow me? Now, how that relates to our life is that, let's say our mother rejects us. In my, my case, my mum wanted to commit me because I was, commit me to an asylum because I was uh, saying I was Jesus. Right? Which many of you probably think might be understandable, but it didn't feel that good for me, right? So what I did was I felt my grief about my mother feeling that way towards me, not even understanding that I'm a very logical person and uh, no matter whether I'm saying I'm Jesus or not, I'm certainly never going to harm myself or another person. So, so you know, and, and she knows that. 
So it, it, she was acting out of fear. But in other words, she didn't really know me. And I felt like my mum just doesn't know me at all, actually, in that act that she took. And she doesn't. That's the truth. So what I had to do was cry about my mother not knowing me or understanding me. Because that was the truth. Because that was the feeling. And it was also the truth. She doesn't know me or understand me. So I cried that out. But in the process of crying, I also realised that actually, once I've healed this, I will never cry about that again. Because when she feels, when she doesn't understand me in the future, and when she proves that to me, it won't affect me at all. Does that make sense? So even in the process of while I'm crying, there's a realisation going on of going, wow, actually, this is a lesson in love for me. And once I release this grief that's inside of me, which I still needed to do, and I did do, once I release this grief that's inside of me, I will understand that my mother doesn't have to love me, actually. And not only will I understand that, I will be perfectly fine with that knowledge yeah and so in other words i'll have shifted from my injured self because i've released that emotion into my real self and you'll have the realization the beautiful realization that every loving thing that comes to me is a gift mm. and you'll appreciate that gift then once we've cried out all the lack of love that really hurts then we realize wow love is this precious gift and we, don't, we won't expect it or feel it should be given to us. Just when it's given, we'll receive it as a gift. But to get to that point requires the release of all of the pain that you've had about love in your life, which is the injured self. It requires getting to those emotions. So does everyone understand the relationship between those be better? I, I know some of you are still struggling a bit with that, but if you can understand that... that this is the area that's going to help you the most. This area here, while it will be very emotional, and what we're finding, myself and Mary, we often observe people getting very emotional and very um, you know, upset and crying a lot and all those kind of things. And then other people going, wow, they're doing so well, they're crying so much, and all this comparison. And, yeah, yeah, and we actually feel that actually all of their processing that they're doing is a complete waste of time. Which, which is sad, because it's such a huge effort on their behalf to do it. Although when you think about it, it's actually an addiction. Our, our own emotional process can become an addiction in itself. Yeah. yeah. And we need and, to be very careful of that. And like for those of you who feel hard on yourselves for not getting into emotions, especially in the beginning, you know, and by beginning I mean the first year, two, <laughs> remember that there's a, there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of fear that has caused you to create this facade self. And it takes courage to be honest with yourself because you're facing the fear that no one's going to love me. And the more, but the more you can do it, the more authentic your processing becomes. Mm. So it's not to be hard on yourself in this process, it's to acknowledge that you've got fear and it is going to be scary to get into the causal emotions because otherwise they would have been cried out in the past. So people who are at the drop of a hat cry, it doesn't mean that they're feeling their causal emotions because, because they're injured, they've got fear. And, and, that's, yeah. and they're possibly feeling their facade self rather than their causal emotions. What's the time? It's time, yeah. Yeah. 20 to 6, I think. It's, uh, yeah, 20 to 6, and we said 5.30 to the venue operators, so we need to start looking at closing down. Um, Tuesday night, is it? It's Tuesday night, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, Tuesday night. Um, we'll be back here again at 6.30, I think. 6, I think. 6 till 9.30. 6 till 9.30. Yeah. 6 till 9.30. Um, so feel free to come back on Tuesday night if you feel like it. Um, the next time we'll be back here in the same venue is not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday. Is that the 21st? 20, 21st at the same time, 1 o'clock. Um, other than that, we're going to Albury for a couple of days and then across to Madura for a, an evening uh, in between that. So we're doing a bit of a trip. But we'd like to thank you for your time today as Thanks, well. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. It's been lovely to see you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hopefully coming up Tuesday we can answer a few more of your questions that you have. Actually, 
you'll probably think of some while you're coming up between now and Tuesday, so you know, for those of you who come back Tuesday, just write them down. We might have a bit less formal session, but we'll probably still record it. So uh, on Tuesday. Depends on how many here. Depends on how many people come. Small group. We might just. Yeah. Small group. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Cheers.